spring moment, but we are now ready to begin our discussion. Uh, please note again that we're asking you to silence your cell phones because we will be linking shortly with KCET uh, television and LinkedIn for the connections for Amnesty International worldwide. While we are getting our guests mic'd up, I want to give you a bit of background. Beatrice Mtetwa received her LLB from the University of Botswana in Swaziland. She moved to Zimbabwe in 1983, where she worked as a prosecutor. Government practices of selective justice led her to establish a private practice specializing in human rights law. She gained recognition for landmark cases challenging sections of Zimbabwe's law and the results of the country's parliamentary elections in 2000. Ms. Ntetwa is particularly noted for her defense of journalists, both local and international. Among those for whom she has won release were detained reporters from London Sunday Telegraph and the New York Times. Her work has been recognized by prestigious legal and human rights organizations around the world. On Thursday, November 13th, Georgia Tech will present to Ms. Matetwa the Ivan Allen Jr. Prize for Social Coverage. I invite Ms. Matetwa to the stage. We are also privileged to have with us this evening Lori Conway, who is the filmmaker for The Rule of Law. She is an independent producer, writer, and filmmaker through her company, um, Boston Film and Video. She was a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University and served on the Neiman Foundation Advisory Board. Ms. Conway's work has been supported by three grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and she has been recognized for excellence by both Peabody and DuPont Awards. Please join me in welcoming to Atlanta filmmaker Lori Conway. I think we are in good position now to welcome also audiences watching via television and webcast on KCE-TV in Los Angeles. Link TV and Amnesty International. You may submit questions for Beatrice and Lori via Twitter, hashtag Alan Price. Let us begin. Thank you. Get the hooked up here. with technical stuff. Is that on now? Are we good? Okay. I thought we would start the questioning with a question to you, Lori, about the film itself. What would you like to share with us about making this important piece? Thank, first of all, thank you all for being here this evening and um, welcoming Beatrice and myself to uh, your campus, which is a lovely place. And uh, it, uh, it's always a, a thrill to be uh, involved in something like this and to have the privilege in spending time with people like Beatrice. Uh, it's a pretty rare opportunity. And I think uh, what I was most struck with when filming in Zimbabwe is that, first of all, it's a beautiful country. It's, it's uh, it's seen better days for sure, but yet it's a beautiful place. And that Beatrice and her lovely family strive for normalcy amidst the uh, potential that anything can happen at any time. But there is uh, the sense that people go out to dinner, people do have, uh, you know, 
girlfriends gathering together, they um, host dinner parties. There, there is a sense of normalcy that is uh, does transcend this this society amidst this Kafkaesque kind of existence that they are faced with daily. Um, and I was so impressed that amidst the, cra the craziness and the chaos, there is this. Uh, very strong community of human rights lawyers like Beatrice, and many of them look to Beatrice for leadership and guidance and inspiration, and she does that day after day after day. Uh, and just last week, uh, we were talking at dinner that a human rights lawyer was beaten terribly as he was arrived at a protest march, and a journalist was beaten uh, and both are in the hospital now in Harare. And so, you know, um, to day after day go through, um, you know, getting up, going to work, knowing that at any given time the other shoe can drop in, in a violent way. And yet Beatrice soldiers on and um, amidst it all, you know, is a great mom, loves to cook, loves to dance, loves to shop. And, you know, it's, like I said, tries to maintain this sense of normalcy. And, and that's what I so enjoyed um, in my getting to know her and her family, is that they have wonderful values and they have such strong moral compasses uh, to do right by themselves, you know, by their families. And um, to just believe that someday change and hope will never, the change will come and hope will never you know, be dismissed because there will be in their heads a better tomorrow, and that's what they fight for, and and you feel that every day when you're there with them. So, what has the reception been like for the film? Um, it, it's been shown in other places, uh, in Africa, in other in yeah. other places in yes. Europe. Um, what has that reception been like? Well, you know, um, Fox Africa picked it up fairly quickly, and um, I haven't gotten much feedback, but the fact that they even picked it up was terrific. Uh, and it's just now starting to be shown in Africa. Uh, a, a, a director of a school in Uganda is uh, inquiring from Beatrice about naming the school after her because they want it to be a curriculum for girls based on knowing their rights as citizens. And I think that would be an incredibly um, appropriate naming of a school based after Beatrice. I can see a whole range of Beatrice schools throughout Africa uh, it, it, because she inspires her model of behavior is really uh, symbolic of a, of a new Africa and new leadership that believes in the rule of law, believes in uh, a compass, a moral compass that uh, is ethical and um, you know, based on good governance and democracy and equality. Uh, and so the film really, I think, in its small, own small way, we had a very small budget to make this film, uh, has somehow been shown on three continents. We gave 5,000 free DVDs away um, to schools and communities and law schools in Africa. I could have given 50,000 away. And it's not the film, it's Beatrice, because she is extraordinary in her behavior and I think there is and especially the fact that she's a woman um, you know people really want to hear her story and in the country and outside the country uh, so we um, you know we're, we're it was sort of a little little engine that could we want to get this out more and more and like I said I could give more DVDs away you know if there were grants coming in the, the interest is there, and, and that is strictly for one reason, and that's Beatrice. So Beatrice, what do you think about this? Having a school name for you, being able to, uh, to uh, share your perspectives and work with others, what's your idea? Well, it, it took uh, a long time for Lori and her co-producer to convince me that anyone would want to watch this documentary. And uh, I've been surprised that, yes, people do want to watch it. And uh, the naming of the school, perhaps, uh, uh, is testimony that maybe they saw something that I didn't see, and that mm -hmm. maybe 
the documentary does make some small difference or at least a slight window where people can look at, at uh, you know, what we've been doing in Zimbabwe and how, you know, a small contribution might uh, resonate with other people elsewhere and might inspire other young people in particular to, 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 to look at whether or not they might make a difference, however small it might be. So it's, it's probably not a bad thing. So let's talk a little bit about the work itself. Um, how would you describe the conditions in Zimbabwe right now? What is the context in which you are working now? Uh, it, it got slightly better when we had a, a, a sort of unity government between the two main ruling parties. That ended last year, and uh, so we're back to a majority of, 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 of uh, ZANU-PF in parliament. So naturally, some of the gains that were made during the inclusive government are slowly uh, 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 being eroded. And so we're getting more and more, you know, abuses, as uh, you heard Laurie say. Although we have a brand new constitution that says people are free to march and protest, uh, the police are still continuing with how they've always done things. They believe that you need their authority to, to protest, despite the fact that the law says we're entitled to. And I mean, this young lawyer and young journalist who went to, 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 to the protest scene because they had been told that the police were, 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 were beating up uh, the protesters, they themselves got beaten up and ended up in hospital. So you can see that, you know, things haven't uh, changed much and that they still need to, to really continue uh, showing that uh, we need full restoration of, of the rule of law in Zimbabwe. And that uh, when police behave the way that they are doing, uh, there is a serious problem that the world should definitely know about. So what keeps you going personally against such a resistance? Uh, my view really is that this is my job. And uh, I do not believe that professionals should be harassed for doing their jobs. If you go to your, your school and you are preparing for a class, the fact that you're going to teach about a topic that someone might not like shouldn't be cause for you to be beaten up. And I think the same applies virtually to, to every other profession. And. Uh, as a lawyer, I should be allowed to do my job, and I approach my job from the perspective that I'm not doing anything illegal, and if somebody thinks I shouldn't be doing it, it is more their problem than my problem. I'm just going to do what I believe I'm entitled to do. Uh, you know, if a doctor who treats a patient, even a patient of a, who's a victim of political violence doesn't get beaten up, why should a lawyer who represents a politician be beaten up for doing their job. So what keeps me going is that this is my job. I took an oath to be a lawyer and to abide by the laws of the country. And the laws of the country say lawyers should be able to do their work. And that's what I'm doing. And one more question before I open it up for the audience. Now, you have a, a way of looking at the intersection between the law, the rule of law, and human rights. Can you talk a little bit more about what it is that you see that you're calling the rule of law with the passion that you talk about it? I, I don't really believe that one can talk of any true democratic dispensation without dealing with the issue of uh, human rights and the rule of law. Uh, I don't think you can talk of true economic development if you do not have the rule of law. I, I think the rule of law is central to any developmental issues, 
whichever side you look at them. Uh, I mean, your investor should be able to know that if they invest in Zimbabwe, their investment will be secure because they'll have, uh, you know, an impartial and independent judicial system uh, to adjudicate on any issues that might arise if things go wrong. Uh, you know, your ordinary person in the street should be able to go about their business knowing that, uh, uh, you know, if things go wrong, they'll go before a judiciary that will make sure that their rights are respected. And uh, those who are crying out for democracy should really have the comfort of knowing that uh, the rule of law will be their last line of defense if things go wrong. So I, I believe, perhaps, uh, you know, from uh, the perspective of a lawyer who thinks everything revolves around the law, that um, the rule of law is central to virtually everything that you do, because without it, the guarantees that you require to live a normal life will not be there. Mm -hmm. Let's open up a little bit. And I remind you that the uh, questions need to be asked through the microphone because we are recording. But uh, do wait to take the microphone. But let me know if you have a question. Steve. Uh, Ms. Beatrice, you just said a series of affirmations saying this should happen, this should happen, the law should. But in the film you said that you were confident that within your lifetime the law will be reaffirmed in Zimbabwe. And my question is about what is the, what, apart from what you're saying it's your job, what is it about the law as such which makes it different from journalism, filmmaking, activism even in the streets, that suggest that the law, if you keep it alive, will in the end triumph. I mean, you obviously have a, a passion for rights as much as, as the right, and for due process. Is, 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 does the law as a process have the power to reaffirm itself even in a situation where you say that the situation is currently getting worse in, in Zimbabwe? What is it about the law that makes it different from, from activism, from journalism, from filmmaking, that, keep that, that, keeps, that keeps you going and keeps you certain that it will, it will triumph. Not that it should triumph, but that it will triumph. Well, I mean, the activism can only happen because you have the protections. And uh, I, 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 for you to practice as a journalist, if the law is somebody is trying to prevent you from practicing your journalism, uh, the law should be able to step in and say you do have that right. If you have a constitution that uh, guarantees uh, freedom of expression and access to information, I believe that it is the law that will then guarantee the journalist the right to practice that journalism. It is the law that should guarantee virtually every aspect of everyday life that you know, uh, people should be able to do what is allowed within the law. Uh, the law should be the last line of defense that says you cannot stop a journalist doing his work because the Constitution has provisions that guarantee freedom of the media, freedom of expression, access to information. The, the law allows uh, free assembly, free association, the law says uh, you shouldn't be clobbered because you are exercising rights that are guaranteed by the Constitution. So I, I believe that the law connects to virtually every aspect of everyday life because if someone tries to stop you enjoying those rights, then we should be able to, to step up and say these are entitlements that cannot be stopped because somebody has a, a, a police truncheon that they can use on you. And do you imagine a day in Zimbabwe that law will function in the way that you just described? Well, uh, perhaps not in the sense that it, it, it functions beyond the normal, you know, uh, 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 
functions that happen everywhere else. I mean, like everything else and everywhere else, there will be limitations here and there. But I imagine that uh, there will be a day when uh, basic rights, certainly first generation rights that uh, are guaranteed by the Constitution will be enjoyed and that the courts will be there to ensure that uh, you know those rights are enjoyed without the fear of of being harassed and uh, i do believe that we will have that day i think we've seen it historically that uh, good always prevails over evil we saw apartheid crumble uh, and when we least expected it we saw the the wall in the communist world fall when we least expected it. And uh, there have been many, many, many historical uh, examples where the least expected happens and, uh, you know, people's rights are restored, even if for short moments. Mm -hmm. There was another question. Good evening. Thank you so much for the, the film and for your work. Um, my question is, I'm just still trying to wrap my head around this problem and its solution. Um, and I'm wondering if this change is going to start at the national level and just kind of be enforced, you know, uh, trickle down or if, if you're seeing this maybe at different local um, spots, I guess, in the country right now. And so some parts of the country are more peaceful than others. Or I just wanted to know what you thought about that. I, I believe that change can only come from the grassroots. It is when the people demand their rights that you truly will see change. If you allow anything to come from top downwards, then it means you will allow the, the oppression that we have seen. Because if you think change is going to come up, uh, 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 from up and, and go downwards, when they don't want you to enjoy that change, the same process will be used. So it has to come from the people. Uh, uh, when people protest, they are basically saying, we demand these rights, they are our rights. And you can see that it is the people saying, we want this. When journalists go out and do stories that they know will get them into trouble, it is because they are saying, we are entitled to do this. And I think if it wasn't for the fear factor, more and more people would be out there actually uh, protesting. Uh, you know, but the more people go out and demand the rights, the more people will come out and, and, and also basically participate and say, these are rights that we're entitled to. And in a country like Zimbabwe, which has leaders who went out to war to fight for these rights, it, 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 it always amazes me that uh, it is the very same people now who are suppressing the very rights they went out to fight for in the first place. So I, I, I think it is because our leaders also know that what they're doing is not right, that they then resort to, 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 to physical violence. If they truly believed that, you know, if you protest, you are breaking the law, they'll take you to court and take you through due process and let the courts decide whether you've done anything wrong. But when you take the law into your own hands and you meet out the punishment there and there without any due process, it is because you know that if you follow due process, you wouldn't win. Uh, so when the Arab Spring occurred a number of years ago, people um, uh, credited communications and new uh, social media, new ways of sharing um, ideas across nationalities. And I'm just wondering about how that is impacting Zimbabwe's population, people on the streets. I'd like to put, have you put that in the context also of you as a, as a female and the women in Zimbabwe. Um, it does appear as though it's a fairly patriarchal society from what I saw. I don't know, maybe you could expand on that. And people also say then another uh, remedy for many of the uh, 
world's ills is to educate women. It seemed as though maybe educating all, everyone, though, was was uh, perhaps a, a bigger need in Zimbabwe, not just women. But so those two dimensions about connections to the Western world through media and also the role of, of women in that context. With social media, you know, the economic collapse of Zimbabwe makes it very difficult for everyone to have access to, 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 to you know, uh, the kind of communication that you are used to in the Western world. So not everybody has a smartphone, uh, not everybody can access the internet, and uh, the, the, the penetration of the smartphones is, is very, very, very low. So at a practical level, it is not that easy for people to communicate with the ease that they communicate with in the West. Um, and the women? The, the, the women, African women, despite being downtrodden, are usually the rocks of their families. And uh, they carry those families through all these difficult times. Uh, but you know, when you are in a country that has 80% unemployment, the worry is first and foremost about just putting basics on the table. You know, do you have food for your children? Uh, you know, the last thing that the, the women want to worry about is, 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 is uh, you know, whether or not they are able to politically participate. Education in Zimbabwe is regarded very, very highly. We have this belief that if you are educated, your problems will simply disappear. But unfortunately, it's uh, the high literacy rate that makes Zimbabweans also uh, look at everything they're going to do and analyze first and foremost and look at, you know, what are the problems. Whereas if they didn't have that education, they'd just go out and throw the stones and do whatever needs to be done if necessary. Uh, but uh, like all, like most African societies, you find that when the chips are down and the economy is down, uh, you know, the boy child will get preference over the girl child because there's the belief that the the girl will get married and go elsewhere and look after other people, whereas there's a belief that the son will remain behind. So yes, we need to ensure that more and more women actually, uh, you know, are educated uh, and that they'll understand that if their kids want to go out and do advocacy work, that they are doing it because it is necessary that people will not look at the dangers of doing advocacy work ahead of the benefits that might come with that. And, uh, you know, generally I would say Zimbabwe is better than a lot of African countries when it comes to, to education and particularly educating the girl child. Uh, certainly more could be done, particularly now when, when the economy has completely collapsed. Questions here? I'm interested in knowing who your closest allies are in Africa. You mentioned South Africa and the end of apartheid. Are there any countries that are lending support to your cause? I found that in the region, basically, the, 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 the civil society groups are very, very tight. We have a lot of collaborative actions. As lawyers, we, we, we have the SADAG Lawyers Association. I was very involved with it. I was uh, uh, the deputy president of the SADAG Lawyers uh, Association until about two years ago. It's a grouping of lawyers in the region. So. We have this thing that an injury to one is an injury to all, and we are very, very supportive of each other. And uh, in fact, last Monday I had to go to Swaziland because one of the human rights lawyers there is in jail and his case was in court. So we, we, we try to work as closely with each other as possible, and uh, we, we, we 
probably the reason I get into trouble the most is that if something happens to me, it's all over as quickly as possible, and that really irritates the government, but it's because of the synergies that uh, we have. Even in Zimbabwe, we have a, a small but very vibrant civil society grouping which uh, is there for each other. Uh, I mean, we have uh, you know fast reaction units. If we hear someone has been arrested, we can group immediately and go and see them and uh, try and sort of reduce the dangers by ensuring that people don't go out on their own at night, etc. So we, 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 I would say in the Sadak region, virtually, you know, every country has been extremely supportive. And so on a personal level, then the question might be, the lawyers protect others. Who protects the lawyers? Um, as I say, you know, we we work together with all the others. Obviously, if a lawyer gets arrested, we also run around and 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 um, and make sure that they are, are, are protected. But I mean, sometimes we had a, a couple of years ago, we had a very interesting case where two of uh, my colleagues were arrested, they're both lawyers, and when we went to see them in the police cells, the policeman said, oh, sorry, they don't need lawyers. Like, why? Said, oh, but they are lawyers. The first accused will represent the second accused, and the second accused will represent the first accused. <laughs> so you guys are not necessary. But uh, we, 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 we have ensured that the doctors have a, Doctors for Human Rights, uh, so that, for instance, when we have to torture victims, the Doctors for Human Rights understand that torture is completely different from a normal assault, and they'll prepare medical reports that will show that this is torture. Uh, we, we have uh, NGOs that uh, deal with the psychological side of things, where you know the lawyer will do the legal work, the medical doctor will do the medical work, the psychologist will say, so that we have a, a, a rounded kind of a holistic approach to the problem. So we try to look after each other as much as possible and uh, to, to ensure that every aspect of a person whose life has been violated is taken care of, at least professionally, and that we have a proper record of all of that. Mm -hmm. And what was it like to defend yourself when you were brought upon charges? Um, at first, of course, everybody uh, was saying it was the most foolish thing to do, as the lawyers will know. Uh, the saying is that uh, a lawyer who represents himself or herself as a fool for a client. So everybody was like, not a good idea, but I couldn't get any of the senior lawyers to, to act for me. Yeah. And the only people who were very keen to represent me were the young lawyers who were very, very nervous about it. So uh, at the first two days, we like, tentative because everyone said, okay, we'll allow you to do it maybe for a day or two and we see whether you are doing it okay. If you're okay, then you can carry on. It actually is not as foolish as it is made out to be because it has lots of advantages. For instance, when you question the witnesses and they lie, you know immediately that they are lying. You don't have to explain to your lawyer that they are lying because of X, Y, Z, you know immediately. So nothing is lost in, in giving instructions and we are able to just, you know, immediately pounce on the, on the aspects which you know are false. And we are able to demonstrate immediately why you say that they are false. So it, it, um, it wasn't so bad, but I had decided that I was going to completely divorce myself. I was not the accused. The accused was separate from me. The accused was my client. I actually referred to the accused when I spoke as a lawyer. I was not there. It was just my client. It just happened that my client was Excuse myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Olga, you had a question? So 
Um, so Zimbabwe used to be a breadbasket of Africa, right? And um, so it's now, as I mentioned in the movie, and it's um, in shambles. It has huge hyperinflation. 80% uh, of people are unemployed. Uh, and like fast track land reform was one of, um, I mean, one of the motivations for that was to distribute land among people. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that it's not happening, right? Uh, what do you see as a, what forces will help Zimbabwe to bring a sort of economic might back um, so people can, can have jobs and they can provide for their children? Well, there has to be political will, really. Everybody, is, everything is tied up to, to political will because all the instruments of taking us forward are there. But if the politicians are not willing to do the right thing, uh, then we, we're not going to be anywhere near where we're supposed to be. I mean, we have the land, but it's in the wrong hands. I mean, if you give me a farm today, I'm not a farmer, so how do you expect me to produce food? And uh, you take the land, you give it to people who have got full-time jobs elsewhere. I mean, farming is a full-time occupation. You've got to be there, yeah, and you've got to know what you're doing. And uh, the, the selective parceling out of the land is, is not helping uh, because there are black Zimbabweans who would be able to do a pretty good job with the farming, but they simply don't have access to the land because they don't have the necessary connections to, to get them that land. And uh, I'm currently doing a, a, a well, it's, I've, I'm just done with it, a divorce for a woman who was married to one of the powerful uh, uh, political people in the country. And uh, one of the things they were fighting over was the farm. And we have a, a constitution that has very, very strong gender equity rights. And uh, the judge who was not a family court judge, who was just picked for this particular case, basically gave the farm to the man. Although the man is a full-time minister, he, he, he works full-time, the woman has always been on the farm for the past 10 years. She has better farming experience. She gave evidence that was uncontroverted as to who is the better farm be, be, between them. And uh, she, she lost the farm, not because she should have, but because her husband or ex-husband is more powerful than her. And so we have this farm which could be productive, which is lying fallow because it's been given to, to, to the wrong person. So if the land was given to the right people, regardless of what color they are, uh, who have the necessary expertise, and of course the capital to work on the land, we probably would still remain the breadbasket of Africa. But it's been given to people who do not have the capital, and farming is very capital intensive. And uh, of course if you don't have title to the property, nobody is going to give you loans. So even if Zimbabwe's economy was still functioning normally, Nobody is going to give you loan without proper collateral. And uh, so it's, it's just a, a myriad of problems that just is making it impossible for the agricultural sector to recover. Yeah, I just wanted to know, um, like, do you see like the overwhelming uh, political environment and uh, not just Zimbabwe, but uh, but when some other African countries that share like the same parallels, uh, do you still have optimism, you know, of uh, like pursuing, you know, and fighting, you know, like for your work, uh, despite uh, Zimbabweans, you know, believing that, you know, even if Mugabe dies, that probably the same political order will uh, still like remain though. And to follow up, do you, do you ever have any regrets in your life that maybe, okay, uh, I should have, pursued, you know, something other than being a lawyer, whether right? it's like a school teacher or maybe like a business executive or uh, something that's lucrative? Well, the problem we have in Zimbabwe right now is that virtually every aspect of life is affected by this. A, a school teacher is affected by this because they, they are unable to teach children who come to school ready to be taught because they might be hungry, 
there might be problems with school fees. They might not be able to get to school on time because of transport problems. Of course, the, the, the tools for educating the children might not be there. And, and so whatever you do, it is affected by the current uh, problem. Uh, what is the point of being a business executive in, a, in an economy that's not working? So I think everybody can see that, you know, we are in a space where we all need to really work together because if, if, if the politics is not right, the political will to do things properly is not there. Every aspect of life will, will be affected. It's just that some professions are not as in the forefront as, as others, but the problems are right across the board. Uh, whether I decided to be a nun or something else, I'll probably still be affected by what's going on, uh, which is why you have people in, in the religious orders being part of the human rights discourse. You, you, you have some business executives being part of that discourse. And uh, basically, the only happy people right now are the few politicians, not even everybody in the ruling party, because it's not everybody in the ruling party who, who has access to resources. It's just a small clique. So even some of the people in the ruling party are not benefiting because the cake is getting smaller and smaller. And once that happens, the slices get thinner and thinner, and only the few uh, have access to those thin slices. Thank you again for this amazing discussion. Uh, I wanted to ask the question about um, kind of the role of the film. And so if, in fact, you could have the international human rights community respond in, you know, three major ways, you know, how would you, you know, what impact do you want the film to have and, and what, were, what are the, like, three goals? of um, maybe influencing um, the international human rights communi uh, community to be supportive of the work that you're doing? Well, I mean, the major, major reason that the, 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 the documentary was done was not to be specific to Zimbabwe, but it was to use it as an advocacy tool for virtually all areas where there are human rights deficiencies. Uh, you know, if, if you are at university and you are told taught about the rule of law and uh, you know you, you need to have an idea of what happens when the rule of law is absent we you know when i was at college i mean we didn't have specifically human rights courses we did have constitutional law courses but it it it's a completely different perspective when you see it in practice and the idea is that if law students for instance see the film and they understand what the breakdown of the rule of law does, uh, you know, it will help them understand that this shouldn't happen. And when it happens, you see it for what it is. Because most of the time, people don't actually make even the connection that this is a breakdown in the rule of law and therefore corrective measures should be taken. So the idea is to make sure that as many people realize that there's a problem as is possible and that where possible they are able to take corrective measures by taking whatever interventions they, or bringing whatever interventions they think might help in the particular you know situation no, maybe Lori yeah, can I was come to say that the importance mm -hmm. to me about using the rule of law was that because it can be so amorphous people don't understand really what this ideal is, what the rule of law means, how it's connected, that it's the foundation of any democratic society. Without it, countries will collapse, as we're seeing in Zimbabwe. Um, and, you know, suddenly when you begin to put pieces together, that if you don't have a rule of law, you don't have any chance at economic prosperity. You don't have public safety, you don't, you're not going to have education, you're not going to have, um, you know, even the ability to feed yourselves because people with impunity can steal farms. Like the, and the irony about this divorce case is the farm that she wasn't given was probably a stolen farm from someone else. Somebody else, somebody else. And so, you know, that shows you how complex 
without the rule of law, how complex and how corrupt things can become very quickly. Uh, so, you know, for us making the film, it was important that we used a prism in, uh, of looking at this collapsing country uh, that could really illustrate um, what Beatrice and other human rights workers were dealing with. And that all of these factors, without rule of law, contribute to the collapse of the country and, and makes her work all the more challenging, all the more important. Um, and really to shine a light on a country like Zimbabwe that for years has been suffering, not in silence, but certainly there has not been, you know, the Arab Spring response. A lot of people have asked me, well, why is an Arab Spring going on in Zimbabwe? And, and I would ask Beatrice and, and my friends and colleagues who I've got to know in the country. And, um, you know, I, I think it, um, it could happen at some point, but um, because the country has deteriorated so much now and um, the unemployment is so high, I was driven to Victoria Falls, which is about a 12, 14 hour drive from Harare. And I said to my friend Robert, who was driving me, what's all this beautiful, why is all this land just overgrown? And he said, oh, those were all farms. And it was one hour after the next of looking out a window at farmland that was no longer being cultivated. And it was astonishing. For 12 hours, I was looking out a window at thousands of acres that are just overgrown of rusting farm machinery in a country that used to be called the breadbasket of Africa. And a can of, or a jar of spaghetti sauce was $8 in the grocery store because everything's imported now. Now, some of that has gotten better since I was there two, two and a half years ago. Uh, but again, the farms are so, you know, they're not being divided up amongst people who can benefit from them, uh, or certainly not enough. So, you know, it was important for us to really just shine a light on what's going on there um, and to use this rule of law as a prism uh, in which, you know, to examine how a country can collapse so, uh, so deliberately because it doesn't exist and the impact that it has. Phil? I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about Mugabe himself and how important he's been in creating this situation. Um, and then, for instance, with the emergence of someone like Mandela, did that have any effect in any way? But I've never met the man for a start, so I, I really don't know him. But I know that the, 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 the coming onto the scene of Mandela didn't help very much because uh, uh, he took the shine out of him, so it was like there was a bit of competition. Uh, yes, this guy who just comes out of jail and everybody is, is, is all over him and uh, making everyone else look, uh, look bad. Um, unfortunately, the leaders in the region have not really been very helpful in ensuring that uh, they uh, live by some of the principles they've set out for themselves as a block in the region. I mean, the SADC has many guidelines on many, many things. They have uh, principles and guidelines on uh, elections and what ought to be basic, and uh, yet uh, they, they really do not enforce those principles. You know, uh, they, they have uh, gender protocols. They have all these protocols that uh, are nice, uh, you know, framed pieces uh, of paper. Uh, that the Western world actually pays for as and when they, 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 they prepare them. And uh, nobody looks at their implementation and their enforcement. So the leaders in the region have literally been what I call a trade union of presidents looking after each other's interests and not uh, basically saying, uh, you know, we have to live by these principles we have agreed to, and that when you do not conduct elections in accordance with the principles we have agreed to, there will be a consequence and some kind of censure. That just isn't there. 
We'll take two last questions here. My question, and I would like to congratulate you on your on your award and thank you for the film. Thank you. But as you can see, maybe not, you know, from the TV, um, our current President Obama, President Obama, if you look at his hair, it's very, very gray from just dealing with the ins and outs. And I look at you and you look awesome. <laughs> and I know <laughs> and I know from having to deal with political uh, the law and just dealing with, you know, the, the detriment of a you know of the people there. When you go to the jails and you see um, sometimes people that are, you know, the, the underrepresentation that people have. And I look at you and, you know, people say that, that most black people from America, African American, I, I just happen to be black, but I'm an American. I cannot identify, you know, with Africans because I don't even know anybody. Nobody in my family has ever said that we were from Africa, even though I know that is the motherland. But I want to say to you, what do you do and how do you keep yourself looking so awesome, even though you're just, I mean, you know, I mean, it's got to be something. How do you, how do you decompress? Uh, thank you for that compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always say to people, actually, it's not all work and all human rights and no fun. And I mean, uh, Laurie was just, uh, uh, Laurie and I were just talking at yeah. dinner about how we were in New Orleans a couple of years ago, and we it was just like a few days before Mardi Gras, and virtually every bar was open all night. So we had our go cups from bar to bar. I don't know how many bars we went to. I mean, look, I have lots of fun even just doing the work because just trying to see how you're going to beat the particular situation can be lots of fun. I mean, you know. Uh, I remember one time we got to the police station when a, a lot of the political activists had been locked up and beaten up and they, they'd just been bussed into the main police station. And when we got to the gate of the central police station, which by the way is supposed to be open to everybody 24-7, uh, there were eight cops armed and they said, which group are you? We were told the group with some cattle shouldn't come in here. And I looked at them, they were all new recruits. None of them knew whom Tetra was. And I said, oh, shame. We just saw some Tetra's group entering the other side. <laughs> and they all ran to the other side and we came to. And so it, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. You, you, you know, you, you put in a bit of fun in it. So you, it's not all gloomy. It's, it's you, you, you have a bit of fun doing it. Even when Andrew Meldrum was deported and uh, we managed to convince a judge to give us an order not to have him put on the plane and to stop the captain putting him uh, on, on his plane. And when we got to the airport with the court order, it, it was, you know, the biblical opening of, of the sea because Every immigration officer, every security officer just ran and abandoned their stations because nobody wanted to be given that order. <laughs> and, and so it, it, it was, I mean, when we sat down and we looked at it, it was like, wow, that was funny because, you know, we were able to go right through, but I mean, we couldn't get into the plane because they had already put him there. Uh, it, it's, it, it has its uh, funny moments. So that sort of, and also you do a lot of running in this job, so maybe that helps. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing that you have emphasized now that we haven't said before is that you have had a lot of victories. You've had a lot of victories. Mm -hmm. And that should be very affirming to you, that yes. the fight is mm -hmm. not for naught, that yeah. you have managed to do some pretty important things in this work. Mm -hmm. There was another question. Well, okay, two last ones, and then we're going to have to to call it a night. Oh, uh, hey, good evening. Mm -hmm. So, talking from the point of view of the people who were traumatized, uh, what do you think would reduce their fear factor? Like you're doing so many great things, but people have seen you as well as uh, journalists being arrested and subjected to violence as well. So. Uh, what do you think will reduce that fear factor? Is it 
education? Is it uh, forming more human right parties? What do you think will help you? I actually think advocacy is, is, would be the tool, which was part of the reason we did the film. I mean, my view is that if the majority of lawyers were prepared to do this, they, they just can't arrest all of us. Mm -hmm. So if more people were really willing to go out there and say, this is not going to happen, and the more people do it, you know, the better it would be for everybody else. And so I do agree with you that advocacy is, is really the main point where people should understand that they, they ought to be safety in numbers. And the more people are out there saying, as lawyers, we will not allow this to happen, uh, they're not going to have 30 lawyers logged up at any given time. So right now, we are targets because we are few. But if there were more of us, it probably wouldn't be as bad as it is now. And one last question. Who? OK, go ahead. Hi. Um, I, I'm just curious to know what prompted you to become a human rights lawyer in the first place and where you get the strength to keep continuing this fight even though you know, you've been met with injustice after injustice, but you've kept fighting and with the belief that even one person can make a difference. Um, when I went to law school, it wasn't because I had any passion for human rights. I didn't even know what human rights was. I didn't even know what I would do with the law. I just knew that I didn't want to be certain things. Some of them I couldn't be because I didn't qualify to be them. So in picking out what I could do with the grades that I had, my finger ended up with law, and I went to law school. And uh, I, it wasn't like I wanted to use the law for something. It just is something that developed as I understood the law and as I saw that you know, certain violations were going on and that maybe the law can be used as a tool to stop some of the violations. And, and it, it, it probably was more a mistake that I got into it, not a deliberate, uh, a conscious decision. Uh, but I think my background might have helped also because I'm the firstborn in a large family of God knows how many children. And uh, so I, as a child, I, I, I had a very, very sort of antagonistic relationship with my father where I used to really push him to do the right thing and to make sure that we got what we are entitled to and that his choice of having many women and many children shouldn't impact on our lifestyles and our rights to certain basic standards of living. And so I think in a way that also helped me because I, I, I grew up having to, to basically negotiate with, with, with the authority from a, a very, very early age. And, uh, and uh, I didn't care very much about the consequences. There were consequences even then, but my attitude was that you can beat me up, but I mean, I'm not going to stop to demand that you pay for my education at a school of my choice, because I have that right. And uh, so that probably influenced my getting into human rights, but it wasn't like conscious. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've had quite a conversation this evening, but I think that the knowledge of what you're doing and how you're doing it and why you're doing it and the impact of your doing it obligates us to. I think that we are obligated to know, and if we know, we're obligated to do. And so advocacy doesn't stop in the countries that surround your country, but it covers uh, us as well. So I hope that we are all encouraged, at least, to be aware of what's going on and to help uh, in our own advocacy to the extent that we can. So thank you very much for coming, and thank our guests for such a wonderful conversation, and our filmmaker for doing just an incredible job in, spend, in uh, presenting to us an exemplar of rare quality. Thank you. Thank you.